Good afternoon and welcome to the 2008 Cheney Lecture sponsored by the Berkeley Divinity School here at, at Yale. I'm Joseph Britton, the Dean of the School, and it's, it's my delight to welcome each and every one of you here for this, for this occasion. Let me tell you a word about uh, Francis Cheney for whom the lectureship is named so that you'll know something of the context in which this afternoon uh, takes place. During his years at Berkeley Yale, Francis Cheney worked diligently to build a learned ministry. He strove to impress upon his students that a truly well-educated clergy is one which knows how to use its knowledge to nourish all manner of people, that the measure of learning is the charitable actions to which it gives rise, and that, quite simply, true piety is acting on what one knows God to be. In recognition of Professor Cheney's quietly compelling ministry, his students and friends joined together to establish the Francis X. Cheney Lectureship in Pastoral Theology at the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale. In this way, Professor Cheney's ministry continues on in our midst. It is a ministry which was always an endeavor to transcend doctrinal and vocational differences and so to address the central concern of the minister as a member of the Christian community, that is, the minister and his or her responsibility for the care of the whole people of God. Now, before I introduce our speaker this afternoon, um, may I remind you uh, <laughs> to take off, turn off any uh, cell phones, pagers, other electronic apparatus that you may have upon you. I, I smile at myself because last night I was just about to get into the pulpit and thought to myself, oh dear, my, my cell phone is in my pocket and it's on and I don't want to be the in one to interrupt myself. So I had to <laughs> dig under all those vestments and turn it off. So thank you for doing that. Now this year we're especially pleased to be able to welcome Krista Tippett as the, uh, the 2008 Cheney Lecturer. Krista graduated from Yale and Berkeley Divinity Schools in 1994. As a theologically trained laywoman, she has pursued an active career in journalism. Most notably, she created American Public Radio's weekly program, Speaking of Faith, in 2000, and continues to serve both as the show's producer and host. And she has now authored a book by the same title, Speaking of Faith. The program has been called, quote, the most intelligent and inquisitive program on religion anywhere on the air. And so we look forward to hearing Ms. Tippett's lecture this afternoon on the topic, Religion, Media, and Public Life in the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming back to Yale and to Berkeley, Krista Tippett. Thank you. Well, this is such an honor for me. Thank you, Dean Britton. And it's also something of a surprise. Um, I was one of these people who, oh, there are friends here too, that's lovely. Um, I was one of these people who came to Divinity School not knowing what I would do with it. And uh, I am the only host in public radio, I'm certain, who has books for exegeting Hebrew and Greek texts in a pride of place near her desk. Um, and as one of my former classmates here recently pointed out, I also have a pretty far-reaching pulpit these days, but I don't really like to think of it that way. That makes me nervous. Um, but the truth is, I can't imagine that I would be using the theological education I got here any more in any other profession. I use it every day. And what's been really thrilling is how the Christian foundation I got here in thinking theologically um, thinking about religious tradition, unlocking sacred texts, those have absolutely been keys to me as I have then gone out to s continue my conversation with people across the world's religious traditions. And it has been a great adventure creating a public radio program about religion in years in which religion moved from the sidelines to the forefront of American life and world affairs. Though in 1998, which is when I first proposed, and this has been a long road, when I first proposed that public radio should have an intelligent, in-depth program about religion, 
I encountered a pretty overwhelming skepticism. There was some doubt, first of all, that religion mattered enough to merit an hour on public radio every week. And, you know, sure, I, that people would say I could document that most Americans consistently report that they believe in God, that they pray, that religion is important to them. But the skeptic asks, asked, could this be true of public radio listeners as well? <laughs> <laughs> really. Weren't they highly educated and of above average sophistication? And I heard that if they did have religious lives, surely they wanted that treated as a private matter. And it is true that in the latter half of the 20th century, though not before, religion did become something in educated Western society that, as the great Boston sociologist Peter Berger says, became something done in private between consenting adults. <laughs> But after the last few decades of U.S. electoral politics, and after September 11, 2001, at latest, Western pundits and policymakers and journalists woke up to the fact that religion never went away in most cultures in the world, nor indeed in this one, and re that religion could still be a force that animated lives and nations and history for better or for worse. We began to grasp that religious identities and religiously fueled passions might determine this post-Cold War century just as ideologies fuel the last. And still, in the mid-1990s, I saw a black hole where thoughtful religious voices should be on public radio and in other media. I had had an early career as a journalist and as a diplomat in divided Berlin, and I had come here to test my discovery that faith could be reconciled with my mind and with all the complexity I had experienced in the world. And I had found a vast and vivid landscape of others here who shared that discovery. But I could not find these ways of thinking and talking about religion reflected anywhere in our public life. Instead, in those same years, Pat Tumen, Pat Robertson, and Jerry Falwell largely dominated the media imagination of what it meant to be Christian, what religious people sound like and advocate. Robertson and Falwell preached, pronounced, and condemned in language that captured headlines and made for great sound bites. Our culture, I think, is still really reeling from that experience. Years after these men exerted the dominance, even in evangelical Christianity, that they exerted in secular media. And so people who heard my idea of an intelligent public radio program about religion had these voices ringing in their ears. They simply couldn't imagine intelligent religious discussion. They couldn't imagine that we can invite people to speak from their deepest places without proselytizing or excluding or making lots of people angry. This is in part the fault of those strident religious voices, and it is in part a result of the fact that a traditional journalistic method is poorly suited to drawing out the intellectual and spiritual content of religion. It makes the humble sound trivial, and delivers inordinate play to strident voices who are willing to squeeze themselves into political boxes of adversarial debate. It is very hard for people of faith to express their ideas in an adversarial forum without betraying the very spirit of what motivates them. Of course, no idea of substance, political or religious, is ennobled by a pro-con, soundbite, crossfire mentality. But I do believe that the content and effect of religious faith is especially distorted and can be rendered dangerous when it is reduced to positions and soundbites. Now, nearly a decade after I began to ponder this, journalism about religion is diversifying. Once upon a time, there were women's pages in newspapers until people woke up to the fact that women were out there everywhere doing everything. And I think the same is happening with religion coverage in pre the press now. It's no longer the exclusive bead of the faith and values editor or the political journalist covering hot button issues. 
On any given week, for example, you might find stories with some kind of religious angle in every section of the Sunday New York Times, not just the front page, the week in review, but arts and leisure, travel, the book review, certainly, and even style. I've heard Sally Quinn, who built the style section of the Washington Post, proclaim that religion is now hot. <laughs> and that worries me a little bit. Okay. Um, but seriously, the shrill religious voices with all the answers aren't as prominent now as they once were, not even in an election year. Some of our most vigorous public prophets of damnation in this past year or two have been atheists. Some of our most vigorous contemporary champions of poverty and global warming as moral values issues are evangelicals. And throughout this current presidential election, all of the candidates have talked about their faith, the, the Democrats sometimes more articulately than the Republicans. Time Magazine uh, coined a wonderful phrase to describe this, the leveling of the praying field. <laughs> and this is all a sign of our times. And it does not mean that we are moving towards an age of theocracy or of sectarian domination of US politics. Such were the fears expressed by pundits and journalists just a few years ago. We are moving, I believe, rather into a period in which the spiritual and religious aspect of life assumes a more robust and diverse place in the mix of our public life a robustness and diversity that mirror the way this part of life works. There will continue to be straightforward religion news in which the extremists who make for dramatic headlines get an inordinate amount of ink, pixels, and airtime. But we will also have a variety of forms to tell the whole story of religion in the world, just as we have a variety of forms for talking religion, or sorry, talking politics, or talking economics, or talking art. I believe that what most Americans want, whether they are religious or not, is for the religious voice in our public life to be more constructive. Journalists and citizens can play a critical role in further defusing some of the minefields that have made religious voices the most poisonous and divisive among us. But if that is to happen, to continue to happen, journalists and citizens alike will have to become more self-aware about instincts and stereotypes that have closed our minds to the importance of all kinds of religious instincts. This is a precondition, I believe, for navigating the 21st century. Because as simple and logical as it is to contend that religion lurks behind the worst crises in our world today, Religion is not going away. Opening our public and journalistic imagination about the nature of religion is a necessary precondition for being able to hear the moderate, open-minded, open-hearted religious voices we say we long for and that our global life needs. Religious people themselves are the only ones with the power to counter the excesses and distortions of their traditions from the inside. Change will not come from the criticism of outsiders, no matter how clever they are or how well their books sell. Now, taking the redemptive aspects of religion seriously does not mean excusing the damage that is done in the name of religion. I have encountered so much grief in my conversation partners across the world's traditions these past years. They insist on an honest appraisal of the destructive energies alive in their faiths. But they also long for a nuanced appraisal, one intelligent enough to take the time and care to unravel extremism from devotion, to distinguish between what is ideological and what is human. And in that spirit, I'd like to name and respond to four educated assumptions that still lurk often unselfconsciously, behind journalism about religion and in places in our larger culture. All of them are true to some extent, but they are too simple. As guiding principles, they stop our culture from hearing, seeing, and telling the truth. The first assumption is that religion is a crutch. I notice 
that often still, when my fellow journalists analyze new religious commitments and spiritual curiosity, in this country among college students, for example, or in China among the new business classes, or among formerly secular Muslim women, they betray between the lines an educated assumption that religion represents a kind of retreat towards supernatural comfort and away from reason in the face of life's complexity. This line of thinking is old. It goes back to the Enlightenment, through Karl Marx, through great sociologists of the 1960s. It's been gleefully repackaged for the present by Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. But in recent years, I've interviewed people across the spectrum of faith, theologians and scientists, poets and activists, parents and police officers. We've traced a powerful, creative, and humbling line between theology and human experience, religious ideas and real life. And I don't experience the spiritual energy of our culture now to be a rejection of the rational disciplines by which we've ordered our common life for many decades, law, politics, economics, science. It is, rather, a realization that these disciplines have limited scope. The very complexity of our age is driving people back to religion's enduring repositories of ethical and spiritual thinking. Wondrous advances in science present choices that human beings have never faced before. Information technologies equip us with mountains and mountains of facts. They instill in us a parallel longing for resources to help us sort and make sense, discern, it's a great word we use in this place, to find meaning amidst the messy animating realities of life and death, good and evil. We can construct factual accounts and systems from DNA, gross national product, legal code, but they don't begin to tell us how to order our astonishments, what matters in a life, what matters in a death, how to love, how to be of service to each other in the world. These are the kinds of questions religion arose to address, and religious traditions, Christianity certainly, are keepers of conversation across generations about them. This is what many, many people in our culture and others, young and old, are rediscovering in the 21st century. Here's a second problematic assumption, that religion is subjective. Religious ideas and convictions have long been suspect um, in journalistic circles, at the very least treated as soft, because it is agreed they are entirely subjective. Yet we routinely weight other kinds of subjective, take weight and take other kinds of subjective opinion seriously. Does political an analysis reflect objective reasoning? <laughs> and here's one. Is economic forecasting an empirical feat? <laughs> Now, I've been posing that rhetorical question for a few years, and I wish it had not proven as pertinent as it has in recent days. Our culture, including our journalists, long ago decided that certain kinds of subjective opinions merit a respectful hearing, though we know that they may be contradicted or proven wrong immediately. And to the extent that journalism about religion is improving, it is honoring and pulling close to faith's subjective insights. Only by doing that can we really get at its power to shape lives and communities, its capacity to nurture and deepen our common life. I'll give you a few examples of what I'm describing and how we've taken this on in my program. Um, do you remember the Terry Schiavo case? Some of you will. One family's personal tragedy became a public drama, political football, and media spectacle. Terry Schiavo's divided family faced one of those choices modern science makes possible. They could decide whether to prolong her life or allow her death. Countless families across this country face this decision every day, every hour, and resolve it peacefully and with dignity. Some political and religious voices declared this to be about the right to life, and the media followed suit. 
Now that was indeed one aspect of the moral and theological complexity of this case. But what happened next is this. We watched a young woman die. Missing in all the public flurry was her real attention to the qualities and the meaning of death. As the media circus died down, I interviewed a medical anthropologist and a Buddhist teacher who for 30 years has worked as a kind of midwife to dying people, accompanying people to the final boundary of life. Joan Halifax described how his, she has seen that human beings are naturally equipped to die. She experiences death not as something to hasten or anticipate, but as an eventual, eventual part of the fabric of life. She's seen how death is viewed in many cultures and experienced in many lives, and in sometimes as an opportunity rather than a defeat, which is how our medical culture defines it. It is always, she says, a mystery, whether that word is imbued with religious connotations or not. Is this kind of analysis subjective? Sure, on some level, but it is also powerful and necessary and practically helpful reflection on a great and enduring area of human experience that politics and law and even medicine itself can't really touch. I think also of a conversation I had with Major John Morris, a chaplain in the US Army, who told me about his experience in Iraq of standing before a bridge across the Euphrates where the charred body parts of four American contractors had been hung on display. Fury consumed him along with a certainty that the people who did this did not deserve to live. They were animals. He would be the agent of God, the wrath of God. And as that conviction seized him, he understood that he was at an abyss that would render him capable of the very actions he hated. God help me and have mercy on me, he prayed. Save me from becoming a debased, immoral human being and save my soldiers as well. Is this prayer subjective? Yes. But prayers like this, theology like this, belongs in our common life. One of the phrases that recurs most often in my interviews from Jewish as well as non-Jewish voices is the moral longing and commandment to repair the world, tikkun olam. In the beginning, Hasidic legend goes, something happened to shatter the light of the universe into countless pieces. They lodged as sparks inside every part of the creation. The highest human calling is to look for this original light from where we sit, to point to it and gather it up, and in so doing, repair the world. This can sound like an idealistic and fanciful tale. But Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, who told it to me as her Hasidic grandfather told it to her, calls it an important and empowering story for our time. This story insists that each of us, flawed and inadequate as we may feel, has exactly what's needed to help repair the part of the world that we can see and touch. Religious traditions offer up stories like this as practical tools to a world longing to address images of suffering that can otherwise overwhelm us. Yes, this kind of moral vocabulary is entirely subjective, but our public life needs moral vocabulary like this just as much as it needs sophisticated political, economic, and military analysis. Still, Instead of listening deeply for insights like this, the prime directive of objectivity seems sometimes to go into overdrive, even when the best journalists are sent to explain uh, and describe the thinkings and doings of religious people. This approach makes religious voices sound less serious and substantial than they are, less than intellectually and spiritually three-dimensional. In 2003, a young man named Gal Beckerman wrote a fascinating analysis of this in the Columbia Journalism Review. He wrote, the theology and faith of the believers is kept at arm's length and the writing is clinical. The journalist glances at religious community as if staring through the glass of an ant farm, remarking on what the strange creatures are doing 
but missing the motivations behind the action. This is another way of describing what my producer, Kate Moose, calls the religion is for weirdos philosophy of journalism. <laughs> and if you start looking for this, you will find it very quickly. Um, it, it's not really an active philosophy, but it does create an impression. Uh, when journalists adopt a self-conscious objectivity, an arm's length approach to faith. It does not lend itself to really getting inside what makes religious people tick and why their ideas are compelling to them and often infectious to others. Third assumption, religion is about what people believe. Equating religion with belief I think is one of the most narrowing instincts in American culture. Somewhere along the way, perhaps in our Puritan Protestant past, maybe someday I will have time to find the historical roots of this, Americans came to imagine that if you can gather, that you can gather a quick understanding of a religious group or person if you can get a list of what they believe. Now while some kinds of Protestants are trained in this kind of confessional speaking, it doesn't, in fact, take you far beyond the surface of who they are. More importantly, most religious faith doesn't revolve around belief at all. Jews and Muslims are not good at talking about what they believe because religion for them is first and foremost about how you live, when and how you pray, what you do. Belief has almost nothing to do with Hinduism and Buddhism nor are most Christians actually good at talking about what they believe. And here is the more important point, because this is not the way faith works day to day, hour to hour. It is, again, about ways of living. It is about making sense of life and the world. It is about ritual and sacrament and community. It is very often more about questions than it is about answers. Religion allows many of us to live more peacefully and creatively with ambiguity and nuance. Those are two of my favorite words, so favorite that my producers limit the numbers of times I can use them. <laughs> Religion is there for us when everything doesn't add up in the midst of life's passions and suffering and frailty. Our culture denies frailty and finitude with a million devices. Religion, more realistically, stares them in the face and invites us to make sense right there. The language of belief has led us, has led us to place voices of faith in the marketplace of certainty and fact and argument. This gets all of us into trouble. At worst, religious passions flattened out into positions and arguments become blunt instruments with the same power religion has to inflame hearts, to infuse life and death with meaning. More fundamentally, a focus on belief severely limits our capacity to comprehend the very nature of this part of life. It's easy to compare a religious belief flatly to a scientific belief and declare it intellectually inferior, or on a media platform to pit a preacher's convictions against a pundit's arguments and find the one more logical and the other fanciful or inflammatory. Convictions are one expression of religious faith, but in many ways, religious truth finds its shape and voice in the same place in us that art comes from. Sacred texts, the Bible especially, employ multiple forms of language to convey truth. Poetry, narrative, metaphor, didactic, wisdom saying. Faith's territory is the drama of human life where art is more precise than science, where ideas are lived and breathed. And think with me, just think of the difference between a great interview with a musician or an artist or a poet and a great interview with a political thinker. We do not put poets on the defensive off the bat or ask them to justify their very existence to prove the factual validity and empirical truth of their work. We marvel at the work itself, at its effect on others, 
at the mystery of its creation, at the way beauty conveys truth, but differently than fact and logic. We probe behind that to understand the spirit that gave rise to it and that it brings into the world. I will never forget hearing one of the best veteran NPR news hosts, I won't give you his name, interview Sir John Polkinghorne after he won the Templeton Prize for work at the intersection of science and religion. Polkinghorne is a Cambridge quantum physicist who in midlife also became an Anglican priest and a theologian. And he is also at the forefront of a fascinating global dialogue between scientific and re re religious and theological thinkers, which you never hear about while you hear a lot about school board controversies and Richard Dawkins. It's not fair. Um, when Polkinghorne won the Templeton Prize, he had just written a book pondering eschatology in light of quantum physics and chaos theory. <laughs> so. Here we have a world-class intellectual and a world-class journalist begins his five-minute interview with this man by asking, how does one bring a scientific sensibility to something about which none of us has the faintest clue? Again, the reality is we invite people to speak authoritatively about things on which we ultimately do not have a clue all the time. Not to kick a dead horse, but we've been talking about derivatives and hedge funds for years. <laughs> At the same time, we routinely seriously engage with different kinds of knowledge, varied ways of knowing, different ways of getting at truths in different circumstances, and on diverse subjects of human experience. In the former Eastern Europe, Poets and theologians were the ones who retained the vocabulary and forms to speak of human freedom and by inference of political liberty. Recently, I spoke with, uh, this was for our program just last week, with a journalist named Rod Dreher, who is intent on making the Republican Party more genuinely conservative, as he sees it, which means, for one thing, environmentally conservationist. And he also thinks that a robust sense of beauty and goodness is a prerequisite for genuine life-giving conservatism. And he likes to quote Shelley, who called poets the unacknowledged legislators of the world. <laughs> John Polkinghorne says, we need both science and religion to, inter to interpret and understand the rich, varied, and surprising way the world actually is. As a quantum physicist, he sees a universe that is supple, and subtle, a mix of determinism and freedom, and this fires his imagination about the nature of God and, for example, what happens when we die and what happens when he prays. And I love this analogy that he offered me when we spoke for my radio program. He said, science treats the world as an object, something you could put to the test, pull apart, and find out what it's made of. And of course, that's a very interesting thing to do. And you learn some important things that way. But we know that there are whole realms of human experience where, first of all, testing has to give way to trusting, and also where we have to treat things in their wholeness, in their totality. I mean, a beautiful painting. A chemist could take that beautiful painting, could analyze every scrap of paint on the canvas, tell you what its chemical composition was, would incidentally destroy the painting by doing that, but would have missed the point of the painting because that's something you can only encounter in its totality. So, Polkinghorne concludes, we need complementary ways of looking at the world. The truth is, you can inhibit a religious voice, rigidify its tenor more easily than you can do so with other kinds of opinions. This part of life is as intimate as anything we try to talk about. And that's a simple explanation for why we make such a mess of it so much of the time. It is a part of life that ultimately defies words. The Quaker educator, Parker Palmer, some of you may know him, makes the interesting point that in our culture, we are highly skilled at bringing our intellect to the public table. We wield opinions and analysis with abandon. And we have become quite adept 
in recent generations at also expressing emotions in the public sphere. But we are quite primitive when it comes to inviting the soul to speak. Parker likens the soul to a wild animal, and if you cross-examine it, it will run back into the dark woods of your psyche. Inviting the soul to give voice to what it knows challenges traditional journalistic instincts about asking hard questions. Hard questions, in my experience, often make the journalist sound tough, but put the guest on the defensive, and they may shut down the insights of the soul entirely. My definition of a hard question is one that elicits a thoughtful and revealing answer may sound soft. I'm told by listeners to speaking of faith that they hear religious people speak with a depth and integrity and evident intelligence that they've never heard on media before. And that is in part because I took Parker Palmer's advice that the soul needs quiet, inviting, and trustworthy spaces to speak its truth. I try to create a, tr a quiet, inviting, and trustworthy space every time I sit down to do an interview. Such spaces are admittedly hard to find or create in today's media landscape. For the record, I'm no longer interested very much in what religious people believe. I'm interested in how they think. I'm interested in how the totality of their experience and knowledge forms their theology, their sense of the sacred, and how their theology and sense of the sacred inform their experience and knowledge. I'm interested in how that changes over time, because all of our answers to these great abiding questions behind the religious enterprise do evolve with age and experience, if we're at all awake. <laughs> I'm interested in the questions people have. We don't spend nearly enough time in this culture, sharing our questions with each other, dwelling on them together. As I said before, I see religious traditions as keepers of the great questions of human life and conversation across generations about them. This virtue of dwelling with questions could be a great contribution of religious thinkers to our public life and a great and edifying contrast to the model journalism now encourages of setting up religious people to proclaim beliefs and positions and therefore answers for themselves and all the rest of us too. I'm going to take a drink of water before I go into my fourth point. You know, I do have an hour-long radio program, but I never speak for an hour. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to get tired of the sound of my own voice, so I will stop soon. Um, so here's the fourth and final assumption behind much of our journalistic and public approach to religion that I'd like to name and expose. The religious dynamics of our time are new and surprising. <laughs> okay. Religion's inherent long view of time, which was part of the reason I came to the Anglican Communion, a long view of time could be a gift to our public life and our journalism, which are often focused obsessively by necessity on the headlines of this hour on what appears important in this moment. To illustrate this, I'd like to discuss two religious groups which have generated a vast amount of media coverage, hand-wringing, and analysis in these early years of the 21st century, evangelical Christianity and Islam. When they suddenly appeared as the stuff of headlines, they were treated at times, even by the best of journalists in the best of newspapers, with a factual carelessness and a short historical memory that revealed more about us than the people we were covering. More than a quarter of the US population, that is a vast and varied swath of humanity, has long, long been evangelical Christian. This is not a new development, much as you would have thought so from media reports about George W. Bush's election in 2000. The modern evangelical entry into conservative politics can in fact be traced back to the Barry Goldwater campaign of 1964, and it has been simmering and mobilizing ever since. Even so, 
any religious identity that encompasses over 25%, some estimates at 40%, of the American population is not a monolithic block. As the religious historian Martin Marty points out, he's one of my favorite people, there is great diversity wherever large numbers of human beings are involved. This is such a simple statement, but it's really critical to bear in mind in, to, in the face of the temptation we have to generalize about people and certainly about religious people. For example, there is within evangelical Christianity a vital tradition of social justice, activism, with political leanings, in some cases more liberal than conservative, it's taken, you know, the New Yorker just found this out about a month ago. They just discovered Jim Wallace a month ago. Um, and as quickly as journalists keep waking up to this fact, evangelical Christianity continues to rapidly diversify and evolve. And that's the story I've been following the last eight years. Changes of heart and mind are supported by the core evangelical virtue of conversion that defines this way of faith. Richard Sizek, the vice president of the National Association of Evangelicals, told me, I don't know, four years ago about his conversion, that's the word he uses, to the science of climate change. And he is on something of a mission to spread this gospel to all the evangelical faithful. And last year, I interviewed a young man named Shane Claiborne. I wonder if any of you have heard of him. He's part of a fascinating new movement that has emerged from evangelical Christianity. It's called the New Monasticism. And the original monastics in Christian history emerged as forces for spiritual renewal around the edges of Roman Catholicism, the then religion of empire. Uh, some might say that this new monasticism is emerging around the edges of current religion, religion of empire. These young people, and they are mostly young, but they are, they're drawing a lot of interest from people at many stages in life. Um, they say they are unimpressed with the narrow agenda of conservatives and the shallow spirituality of liberals. They are not at all sure that Jesus would recognize what goes on in the churches they grew up in. In response, they are digging out what they see as the core of Christianity in which they nevertheless experience life, meaning, and truth. They are throwing in their lot with the poorest of the poor. Shane Claiborne founded his community, which is called The Simple Way, on a ravaged street in North Philadelphia 10 years ago when he was 19 years old. He and his kindred spirits uh, find role models deep within historic Christian tradition. St. Francis of Assisi, Dorothy Day, Martin Luther King Jr. He actually went and spent some time with Mother Teresa before she died. At the same time, their vision is distinctly up to date. They have a global holistic sensibility, a pragmatic capacity to connect the dots between local need and global crisis. So, expanding on an old adage, Shane Claiborne says to me, we give people fish, and we also teach them to fish, and we also have to ask, who owns the pond? <laughs> and who polluted it? <laughs> These kinds of evangelicals are barely on, ev on journalistic radars. A too rigid focus on too narrow a definition of conservative Christianity has also led journalists to conflate terms like evangelical, fundamentalist, and Pentecostal, using them interchangeably. That drives me crazy. Um, but these are a way of being Christian with wildly diverse historical roots and theological impulses making very different imprints on the contemporary world. Similarly, the Muslim world another catchphrase of the world we inhabit now, is not interchangeable with the Arab world. Though these interlinked phrases dominated media analysis in the wake of September 11th, as we have gradually learned to see, the Muslim world extends as vitally through Paris and Detroit and Indonesia as it does through Saudi Arabia. Islam is or soon will be we don't quite know how to count these things. The second largest religion in the United States, a trend that was foreseeable long before September 11th. 
One third of uh, American Muslims are African American. This is one of the many features of North American Islam that gives it a distinctive face and trajectory from Islam even in Western Europe. A woman, Ingrid Mattson, was elected president of the Islamic Society of North America last fall. She is at Hartford Seminary. Um, you may know about her uh, from being in this place, but nobody heard much about this in the press at the time. Uh, when she became president, headlines were focused on European controversies around women wearing Islamic dress. Ingrid Madsen is a remarkable woman. She calmly resists pressure to lead defensively or reactively in any direction, and she certainly is under enough pressure to do that. She is committed, foremost as she puts it, to the slow, patient work. Could there be anything more countercultural? of contributing to lasting change in Islam by building a model Muslim community in the United States. Finally, while Islamist violence is a great threat and crisis of our time, violent religious ferment is not, in historical perspective, a new event. The great traditions have survived across millennia because they express insights that human beings have repeatedly found to be true, but they are containers for those insights, fashioned and managed and carried forward by human beings. And so they are prone to every flaw and fail frailty of the human condition. Religion becomes intimately entangled with human identities, and there is nothing more fundamental and powerful and volatile than human identity, especially in moments of historic transition like ours. So, Islam is 700 years younger than Christianity. Roughly 700 years ago, Christians were beheading infidels, burning people at the stake, and waging global holy wars. Many of us, citizens, politicians, and journalists alike, saw global Islam for the first time on September 11, 2001, and what we saw on that day were terrorists attacking us. But in latching on too quickly and appreciatively to punditry on the meaning of this, and thinking especially of the phrase, the clash of civilizations, our collective learning curve was distorted. The crisis of Islamic violence in the 21st century is not, first and foremost, a confrontation with the West, not by a long shot, though that may be one of its dynamics. It is first and foremost a crisis within Islam for Muslims who continue to be the victims of Islamist violence in overwhelming proportion. Now here is a defining difference between the turmoil within Islam at present and the periods of fanaticism that preceded and followed the Christian Reformation. The Crusades were not televised. The Inquisition was not available for viewing on the internet. The terrorizers of the Thirty Years' War did not have modern travel, communication, and weaponry at their disposal. So, in a globalized world, in a very basic sense, the questions and dilemmas facing Islam face us all. They are our questions, our dilemmas as well. We all, Muslim and non-Muslim, have a stake in their resolution. Though I will hasten to add that that resolution is going to be a matter of generations. It's not something that will happen in five years or ten. So how should this form journalism about Islam in the years to come? How should it form Christian theological thinking and engagement with Islam in the years to come? I pose these as questions, challenges that I too continue to ponder. I want to end by addressing a question which is always on my mind in the interviews I do and the programs we produce. It's the so what question. What do these observations have to do with the vast and varied lives of those who are listening? What tools do they offer up for practical application once the conversation ends? Most of you are not journalists. You are citizens from many walks of life, many professions. Some of you are students. You are all educated, in some sense all intellectuals, and people of faith. 
I would like for you to consider that our common life needs your strong voice in the mix of opinion, wisdom, and knowledge now more than ever. It's easy, as I did at the beginning of this talk, to lay some of the blame for religion's fraught role in U.S. public life at the feet of Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and the media that amplified their voices. But in a democracy, as the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel reminded us, in a democracy, while some are guilty, all are responsible. He was talking about Vietnam. I'm talking about the culture wars. I think it's almost as critical. I often quote an exquisite line of Yale's own Miroslav Volf, that the answer to the problem of destructive religion in the world is not less religion, but more intelligent and constructive practices of faith. I am deeply concerned about intractable divisions, virtual civic battle lines that now mark American life. These have not been caused by religious voices alone, but religious voices have deepened them. They have, ironically, been rendered ostensibly irreconcilable, in part by Christians. Think about that. The bitter debates of our political life on subjects like abortion and gay marriage are the transposition of human confusion, fear, and fighting closer to home in families, communities, and even churches. In navigating the admittedly important, difficult questions of our age, religious people themselves have fallen into the trap of navigating by way of positioning and legalistic debate, which distort the spirit, if not the letter, of their faith. Even in academic theology, even in parish ministry, too many of us have focused too much on articulating the point of view, the beliefs, our understanding of scripture and tradition call us to. But the measure of Christian fidelity, for example, in these great debates of our age, cannot merely be about the positions we take, but about the way we treat friends and enemies along the way. The great rifts of our time over intimate subjects of life, death, and sexuality beg for healing, repair, and peacemaking as profoundly as they beg for answers and resolution. These are things Christians are supposed to know about. The first line of Reinhold Niebuhr's Nature and Destiny of Man still provides a brilliant starting point for stepping back to unravel the mess we're in. His words, man is his own most vexing problem. <laughs> I'll tell you, we, uh, we talk sometimes about having a line of t-shirts, because we are a public radio program after all. We either, we either need a coffee mug or a t-shirt. So my producer wants to have one that says, I am my own most vexing problem. <laughs> <laughs> So invoking Niebuhr reminds us of another utterly distinctive contribution theological thinkers have to offer our common life. That is sophisticated analysis, not just of God and not just of moral standards, but of the blessing and the problem of human nature. Recently, for a program that will air a week or so from now, I heard this echoed by a contemporary religious leader, uh, Bishop Vashti McKenzie of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was speaking with me specifically about how information technology is not just changing the world, it is changing human relationship in ways that we haven't even begun to fathom. And she is emboldened in her calling as she also sees that churches Religious communities are among the last places in Western society where we focus together on human relationship at an existential and communal level. When people ask, where is the Niebuhr of our day? That's a fashionable question in circles I move in. Maybe it's a fashionable question here. I think of someone like Vashti McKenzie. Niebuhr belonged to an American culture in which a white Protestant Christian male voice could have a primacy and privilege that are unimaginable now. Public theology in our time must be a far more dispersed, multifaceted, and multiply articulated thing. And I believe that the Niebuhrs of our day are to be found less in the spotlight 
and more at work locally, regionally, within religious traditions and outside and across them. A great paradox of globalization is how it magnifies the potential ripple effects of what is small, local, and distinctive. Much is said of the shadow side of globalization, but this, I think, is an empowering and mysterious gift. And so I want to finish and leave you with a challenge. Whatever else you do, wherever else you land, if you are being trained here and heading out into the world to be a leader, you can also be public theologians. This means, in my vision, modeling and teaching the virtues that accompany the work of theology, not just the thrilling ideas. It means connecting up grand religious ideas with messy human reality, which is more challenging beyond these hallowed walls than it is within them. It means, as Niebuhr did, articulating theological points of view that challenge and deepen thinking on every side of every important question. As a life-giving antidote to the distortions and excesses I described as I began to speak, I long for a new generation of public theologians at every level of American life. And I have every reason to hope that I am looking out at a room full of them now. So thank you for the honor of addressing you. And um, we're going to have some time for a conversation, right? Okay.